Hi, my name is Pat Adams, a spiritual director and blogger about the spiritual life. The consuming interest of my life has been this, how do I, how do we live a life centered in God? And yet deeper still, who am I really? What is my purpose? How do I connect deeply with God? These are the questions I will address in this video series. The Exodus story divides naturally into four parts. First, extricating the Israelites from Egypt. Second, wandering in the wilderness up to Mount Sinai. Third, absorbing a new way of living during 40 years in the wilderness. And fourth, crossing the river Jordan into the Promised Land. Today's video starts a series of four now through February on the Exodus story, translated into modern terms. I see it as the template that God has left us for getting out of slavery to our world and our culture and crossing into the Promised Land, the Kingdom of God. And so we start part one. Being enslaved in Egypt represents the world we live in. And by the world, I mean the culture we live in with its mindset about life, the family we grew up in, what the schools taught us about being an American, and finally, and most importantly, our own self-image, which drives so many of our choices in life. All these influences that we grew up with continue to impact us well into our adult life unless something derails us from the trajectory they sent us on. What can derail us? A serious illness, the death of someone important to us, a call from our own soul or from God that we pay attention to, something that calls our attention to a whole different way of life. In a sense, our inner Moses is then awakened, that part of us that would lead us to our own true selves, an unknown center of ourselves that is buried deep within us, underneath the cultural, familial, and even personal influences and choices. The Exodus story is well known, but let me summarize this first part in which God calls Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, empowers him to confront the Pharaoh who will not let the Israelites go. Through Moses, God sends plague after plague, ten of them. First, the Nile River turns to blood. Second, the frogs. Third, gnats. Fourth, flies. Fifth, the livestock die. Sixth, boils all over the Egyptians, seventh hail, eighth locusts, ninth darkness, and tenth the death of the firstborn sons and calves. Pharaoh promises freedom for the Israelites after each plague, then reneges. But finally with the last plague he lets them go. And once the Israelites have left, God prods him again and he leads his army and all the chariots out after them. He catches up with them at the Red Sea, which the Israelites are about halfway across on the ground that the Lord had Moses create by waving his staff at the sea. The Egyptians and the Pharaoh enter into this channel of land as the Israelites are safely on the other side. Moses waves his wand and the sea settles back into the channel of land and swamps the Egyptian army and the Pharaoh. How very hard it is to leave Egypt, to leave whatever enslaves us. It is our normal, our security, our known place, even if we hate it. We're used to it. We resist change. We are more likely to stay in slavery than to rise up and leave. So it takes an act of God or something equally dire to get our attention and to entice us to leave our lives problematic as they have been. Moses is that part of us that would go, but you can see in the story how powerful the Pharaoh is who represents the ego, grasping, manipulating, using us, pulling us back. And this is the Pharaoh within us, not some earthly king. It takes a great step into the unknown, a leap of faith that we will come through the trials for us to move out of the familiar. 
We can see this pattern of behavior in an abused wife who won't leave her husband, no matter how much he beats her. She makes excuses for his behavior, believes that he really loves her underneath it all. But often it is also that she doesn't see how she could make it on her own in the world without him, an idea he has certainly promoted. Egypt is a rich land because of the Nile River flooding its banks and fertilizing the soil. Of course, the Israelites have none of the wealth, but nonetheless, it has been a land where they were fed, they had herds, etc., and they were enslaved. What has you captured, enslaved? Is it our culture of needing more and more money or status or some things before you can relax? Is it others telling you what you should do with your life? Is it the American way of being in the world, decisive, direct, knowing what is right for everyone to do? Is it a denial of your own gifts, or a sense that you have to ride on the culture's train, no matter whether it works for you or not? That you have to work long, long hours, that you have to commute a long way, that you have to fill in the blank, and then ask why, and fill in the because. What drives you? What is it that you're going for? Are you even aware of what drives you? Often these unconscious drivers are set early in childhood by the age of five or six. We adopt a strategy that will make up for what we've learned that we're lacking. These strategies are usually based in shame and guilt at our inability to be obedient, to follow our parents or teachers' rules and so we decide to compensate. For me, I decided on extreme self-consciousness, second-guessing about whatever I do to make up for the inadequacies. Others might realize that they just can't ask for what they need, so they deny themselves. Or another might focus on how flawed she or he is. What did you decide about yourself at a young age? Is it still driving your behavior today? This basic unconscious driver within us is the pharaoh, our ego, which is willing to play any trick to keep us in Egypt, where he wields all the power. Contrast this early childhood decision about our own deficiency with God in the story realizing the pain of his people and sending a man, Moses, to get the Israelites out of slavery. God cares about your circumstances and doesn't want you to suffer trying to do what you are not designed to do. He sees your circumstances and doesn't blame you or call you to task. He just moves in to help. He is calling you all the time to a better way with hints, suggestions, invitations, etc. Not one of the plagues touched the Israelites. They were unharmed. Nor did the Egyptian army touch one Israelite as they chased them down. They were protected, and so are we. This is not to say that nothing bad will happen to us, but at the very least, God is in it with us, consoling, comforting, and companioning us. At God's instruction before the Israelites leave Egypt, they gather up gold and silver from among the Egyptians, who are anxious to get rid of the Israelites because of the plagues, particularly the last one killing off the firstborn sons and the firstborn calves. The first part of the Exodus story is about moving ourselves physically out of the place where we are enslaved. It isn't the end of the story, only the beginning. We've escaped the Pharaoh's army, we're free on the other side of the Red Sea, but we're in the wilderness. Before we take a good look at our new surroundings, we sing a song of thanksgiving to God for bringing us out of Egypt, for defeating the Pharaoh and his army, for keeping us safe, for going on this journey with us. Next month, we'll look at part two, wandering in the wilderness up to Mount Sinai. Thank you for watching. I look forward to hearing from you soon.